today I'm going to talk about from chat GPT to production and to bring these things uh, kind of operational. And it's been an amazing year, right? So we follow how OpenAI and most of you know chat GPT has grown not just from chat to plugins, find information real time on the internet, understand images, diagrams you load up, you can add your own data, it becomes even smarter. And it's innovation, but they delivered amazingly over one year. And if you're like me, uh, I was in the company and everybody was so excited. Product said, oh, this kind of new feature, we want this, it's, it's gonna be so great. And marketing said, well, you know, we can use this to be you know, competitive and bring this up. Uh, and kind of the CEO, CTO, whatever oh, or say you want. They were like, okay, we're gonna make money with this if we got this down. But me being responsible for engineering, we're like, how the hell do we make this happen? So this is a little bit of that story. My name is Patrick Dubois. I try to be an independent voice in the industry, but for now I'm working at VP as a VP of engineering at Showpad. And why is that important? Because Showpad is part of the journey that I'm gonna talk about, but also, you know, listening to many other stories in the industry, I tried to make this a synthesis of a year and of learnings. So some of the things that Showpad is, Showpad is a content management system for sales and marketing people, and they have a lot of content. So some of the features that we're building with this generative AI is a better search. Instead of just using keywords, obviously you can now ask questions. Another example is that we have again, that many content. So people are having a hard time finding it and reading it all. So we create summaries out of that. And from all that material, we also want to train people and we generate questions and answers like quizzes to kind of get people trained on those content. So these are a few of the, the product features that we were looking at that we have implemented and things that we learned along the way. So. In this uh, presentation, I'll take you through the typical DevOps lifecycle. We're gonna build part of the applications. We're gonna deliver it through a pipeline. We're gonna talk about how to operate this and then run this business as usual. I wanna make it clear that I will be talking about how we can use DevOps to deliver Gen AI. I'm not gonna talk about the opposite, use Gen AI to do better kind of DevOps. If you really want to look out for that, there is a, this, a great slide for, by Tracy Bannon. She also has a talk on this uh, that was delivered at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. And she talks about all the different flavors, all the different things you can do with Gen AI in DevOps. But again, I'm not covering that. It is just for your convenience and you can look at that there. So, like I said, the first part is we're going to build an application. And what do we need to build a Gen AI application there's five parts. There's the prompt, the text that you type, the model, GPT or others that you use to send the prompt to. Then you want to mix this with your own data. You hook this up to your own APIs. And then somehow you're going to use a middleware or an orchestration framework that puts all these things together in and make it an application that people can use. So first part is the prompt. And some of you might have heard about prompt engineering. And what is that? So when people ask questions in ChatGPT, that is called a prompt, a text, a question. But you can get a little bit more intelligent by adding something like, before you ask the question, hey, you're an expert in sales. And that all of a sudden you get better results when you ask the question. It's kind of like a little bit of tuning that it understands better what you want. And then you can also give examples in your prompt. I want to have a solution for A, but here's two examples on the subject that I want. And you kind of make it more complex. And there's whole strategies like change of, chain of thought, which kind of like puts the questions in a step or a series of questions and answers, or even pre of thought we can kind of like give me an answer, but give me five answers first, and then kind of step by step, look through all these answers and then kind of pick the best of those answers. So it's more advanced than a simple prompt. It's a whole field of how do you kind of get the, the best out of 
the question and answer. So it becomes more complex and it becomes even more complex when we want to have structure in the answer. So uh, let's say I want a list of all the names, but I want it as JSON in a format that has first name is a string, last name is like this, age is a number. So I have put like more structure on this. And sometimes it will fail to put that structure on there and you will have to retry. So in the end, you'll get the completion, but it is a lot more complex than this simple question answer to get like a good and repeatable question and answer. People are heavily investing in this. This is an example of investment from Salesforce where they kind of look at these uh, prompt patterns. Again, this is just for your reference, but it shows that there's money to be made to have a good prompt uh, that gives good answers. Another good thing to compare that is we're going to have multiple models. So you might play around this like one question to one model. One uh, will give different results. But this is a nice uh, tool to kind of play around with. Um, so what have we learned? It is not that one prompt. It is multiple prompts. Things might not be correct the first time. So we'll have to retry. And what it results into is that there is a response time for each of the question and answer just take longer and longer <clears throat> to get the right answer. We also notice that if you put an extra enter, a comma, and a, a new line, all these things impact the result. So you kind of have to be very picky, very structured to kind of make this work. But you can use some of the patterns, as I mentioned, to kind of get better results. And it does depend on the model that you use. So if you get an upgraded model, all of a sudden, maybe you get like different answers. Let's move to the next part. So we got the prompt. We're sending this to a model. In the beginning of the year, obviously, chat GPT in the name, there's GPT as the model. But there's a lot more of models that exist. Now, Google has one. Amazon has one. And it's been an explosion over the last year to kind of go from smaller models to the uh, large language models and each kind of, of the competitors have this now. So that's good. Now you have a choice. And you have even more choice to go with open source models. So this has grown over the last year. It, this hugging phase is kind of like a GitHub for open source models. It already existed for things like text to image or kind of estimations, but it now also contains a section on large language models. And that has been heavily influenced by also the open source model uh, by uh, from uh, Llama, which was kind of leaked unintentionally or not from Facebook, but it's now one of the bigger open source models that you can use. Another thing to consider is when you use a model, uh, to pick a model, is that they have different sizes of questions you can send to. So the prompt is sometimes limited. So you will notice that when you kind of paste a lot of information in the question. Uh, and some of the models have kind of a bigger uh, context length that you can paste in. Claude has 100K, so that's kind of getting close to a book. But you have to have uh, kind of be vigilant about this. We found that it's not always because you use the bigger kind of context window that it is better. There's a paper out there that shows that um, when you put the question in and the answer, uh, you want to get the answer. If the prompt that you're putting in is too long, the LLM actually forgets things in the middle. And maybe that's just mimicking our human behavior by saying, well, you know, we're very interested when, you know, the document starts, then we glance over and then we'll look below. So it's, a, it's an interesting observation on the LLM. So bigger content land is not always better. That's what I want to say. It's, you still want to cut this up into smaller pieces. So the delay is still uh, uh, there. And then the other one is the model size. Uh, it is basically the number of, think about the model like a big matrix. And so the number of dimension the matrix has is supposed to be uh, kind of giving a better result. But what you notice is that some of those models are not trained very efficiently. So one of the, there is a correlation between the number of parameters and the number of tokens you can put in. So why is that important? Because if you kind of use a model that is has many dimensions, the memory and the cost to run it will be high. 
but you want to have one that has been optimized for uh, a, this correlation between both of them. Again, another paper for your reference. This is the extend, extended version of the talk, by the way, so you'll ha have some extra references in there. So bigger is not always good. Um, so when you pick a model, be aware of that. And obviously when you select a model and the bigger size, the bigger kind of context length, uh, the bigger dimensions, it will have an influence on the price. So here you see the different pricing, GPT-4, GPT-3, Claude, based on the context window. And you see the, you know, the, the big differences from you know, per million tokens, uh, 60 uh, kind of dollar, $2, uh, so uh, sorry, $2 million, uh, $2. So it, it is a big difference on what model you actually choose there. So be aware um, about that. Some of the models, like I mentioned, you can run open source and there's specialized hardware to run this on. So while you might think about GPUs, you can get a little bit of the cost down to use specific uh, CPUs for inferencing your model. And also thanks to another uh, kind of technique called quantization is that you can take the open source model, which has a lot of parameters, and you can make it smaller. You can reduce some of the dimensions so that it's actually possible to run a large language model on your laptop. Here I show the example from, from Oloama, but there's many out there that you can just run on your laptop, which is pretty amazing, uh, the state that this is uh, going to. And I want to highlight that over the year, uh, open source started with kind of like on the back they were like not on par with the uh, kind of production models or the vendor models. But now you can see that slowly they're getting on par. And this is pretty important if you want to run this on your own. You don't want to depend on a vendor. Uh, so it is really exciting to see. Another thing we found is that whatever model you select, you have to be aware how it has been trained. And I'm not gonna say you can have this perfectly, but I just wanna make you aware that whatever model you use, they might have gender bias. Remember, it has been trained on the internet and we do tend to have the gender bias and the same with racial bias. So kind of when you use that, maybe also under, try to understand how the model was trained, what document was used uh, to kind of uh, understand how your, the quality of your answers will be there. And the other thing, if you're using one of the SaaS um, models or the providers, be sure that you understand how to opt out. And not only opt out on kind of putting the question and the answers that they learn from what you uh, ask, but also obviously you need to opt out on your website that they don't uh, use your data for training. And much like we would have the robots.txt, now OpenAI, for example, they would look at a specific user agent that like uh, make sure that they don't call your website for uh, adding uh, data to their model. So we learn a lot uh, about the model. We learned that it's not about M ML ops. So we don't build our own models right now. The context window, the latency is important. And we also learned that while you can go to one of those providers, Google, Amazon, or Microsoft, it is not that they have the quality that you expect. There's still some kind of flakiness. There's some delays. There, the quality of control is not there. But you know, it's getting a lot better. I showed you that there is a different kind of serving model. You can use a SaaS provider. Amazon provides like um, a broker that provides multiple uh, models by using the same API, or you can go with the approach, run your own model in like a zoo, they call it, uh, it's just run it on your Vertex or your SageMaker, uh, how would you, you would run your existing models. Open source is really getting good. And one thing to highlight um, is that we like to think about the models as a bronze, silver, and gold. So there's cost, quality to consider, um, speed to consider. So depending on your use case, it might be good to have a smaller model, a cheaper model that is enough for your use case. Let's say summarization is something you can do offline. Uh, it, it is cheap to do. So you select an other model. And if you want to have full quality, uh, you can uh, have in real time, then you kind of go for what we call a gold model. Often you find information about the origins of the data of the model 
And you will do have to look at the small print to kind of understand what license to use the model. All right, third component, bring in your own data. So we've talked about the privacy aspect and it's one of the big things that people don't wanna, or they're very scared about putting, uh, having their data turn up in the models uh, or the generic internet models. So one way to do that is to use an existing model, but to actually not have your data come into the model, but to use it in a prompt. And you see that um, to solve, a, um, let's say a question, you say, here's my question, but here are three pieces that are from my knowledge base to solve the question. Please use those three pieces and answer the question. This concept is called retrieval augmented generation. And it's a solution to kind of do real time. You don't have to train your own models. It has access control because you're mixing your own data in there at real time. There is another option to fine tune the model, but it is not what we would recommend right now. Like keep using the rack model. Now, how do you get all your data into the prompts? Imagine you have a question. And how do you find the pieces which are relevant to that question? So the way it works is that uh, you take all your documents and you start splitting them up in pieces by paragraph uh, and kind of you calculate uh, what is called an embedding. An embedding is kind of like a factor in a multidimensional space that uh, kind of shows similarity. Two pieces with a vector that are very close are similar and so if a question and an answer is similar, we know that we can look this up. So all these calculations on those pieces of text, we store that into a vector database. And it is basically storing an index out of these vectors. It's like a numeric value and uh, this piece of data. And so when we have a question, we'll look this up and we mix that into our prompt. And to extract this information from unstructured uh, documents, we can use a tool like Unstructured, which understand the parsing of PDFs, Word documents, PowerPoints, all that stuff to make it easier for us to extract that information. And to store the vectors in that vector database, there's specialized things like Chroma um, and Pinecone uh, on the left, but the big storage vendors or database vendors, they're also having a way now to store this. So you might not ha have to go for a specific one, but use an existing one uh, in your area. Uh, but what's interesting is this whole rack thing, you know, you might do it yourself, but we expect soon there's gonna be a solution off the shelf by a SaaS provider. For example, knowledge bases of AWS coming soon. Fine tuning, again, there's a probably a commodity. You don't have to do it yourself. There's going to be a service. And this is going to be a team that, you know, whatever we do right now, there's probably going to become a service and we'll move on to that. Another thing to note is that while you're implementing, for example, uh, AI powered search, you would say, well, you know, people just type a question and they'll get the answer. We'll make sure all the embeddings and the vector database solve this. We found it to be hard that people still use keywords. And so we have to kind of check whether the query is a keyword or the question, or is a question that is answered. So that, that people want answered. So there is kind of like a transition of people so used to typing in keywords uh, that you might want to be aware of. Um, so mixing in all that data is good. And I explained the chunking and the, the splitting up in the vector days, but obviously, if you want to have that own data, uh, having a good data lake to put and retrieve all that information is good. I would advise you to expose this as an API so they don't use the database directly. Uh, that solves your access control to which data and that you can have a query do this at runtime. And the calculation of the vector uh, embeddings is something you want to keep close to your data because when your data is updated, you want to have a recalculation there as well. I mentioned the chunking, and if there's one thing you want to remember, like try to forget, <laughs> it's uh, strange, but try to forget that you need fine tuning for everything. Go with the rack pattern as much as you can, because it's going to save you a lot of time and effort there as well. Right, we got 
to the fourth piece, which is about APIs and agents. It's probably the least defined thing, but what is the difference between just a question and an answer uh, uh, that we do and an agent? Well, typically you would ask a question, but the, uh, the question would be more a task that you wanted to perform. And that task could be um, kind of has a clear goal that it needs to solve. So the agent will actually start going through a series of prompts and it might, for example, ask something over an API, but it might also trigger a workflow to your colleague. So it is, the difference is you have one question and then internally it does a series of different actions and then it comes back to you. So that seems to be an interesting place where the industry is going. The first part, you know, question, answer, summaries, those are like the trivial parts that we expect to be somewhere in the fabric. So imagine in our use case, we have a sales GPT that actually understands whatever is being sold. And it, you say, you know, find me information and it goes off. Again, we haven't implemented this, but it's an interesting kind of proof of concept that you might find on the internet to do that. The same actually goes for, you know, coding and other stuff. But uh, again, I'm not touching that part. And we can imagine that all these AI assistants, whether it's the sales, the legal advisor that you need in, in a contract, kind of, you know, the, the, the storyteller to kind of bring this, they're all going to form a team uh, of assistants to kind of guide the people doing the selling or the buyers, uh, to have a better experience in there. And you might think, is this far off? Well, rumors are OpenAI is gonna release agents soon. So that's gonna be interested, interesting how that uh, will come alive. And I found this quote very interesting is that while you're moving to the agent space, um, you start thinking about not building the thing, which is kind of the whole exploration that we did before, but you start building the thing that builds all the things. And that's kind of a new mentality. It brings another layer of abstraction uh, on how to think about what we are doing right now in the industry. So we learned that um, APIs and agents are you know, kind of the next thing. It kind of works, but we don't have confidence in it yet on our own because we still you know, want to have certainty on the answers. But we did learn that we have to capture more context uh, of things happening uh, in, uh, let's say you have a Zoom call, you can say somebody hit the start and the stop, uh, stop button, but you also want to capture like who was on the call, what was the description of the call. So you want to capture context and your events kind of uh, together. And we'll move there, but we were uh, we are not there yet, but we'll have to move there soon because that will be the differentiator between all the things uh, in the future. Coming to piece number five, it is where all the things come together. So an orchestration layer, think of it as a middleware, whether that's your Spring Boot or anything similar. Uh, it is just a framework that combines the prompt, the model, the data, and the API. And it makes like good reusable components. It helps in debugging the things. It helps you swap out a new model. It helps you in the routing, uh, use that model for this, use that model for that. So there's a lot of the tools that, uh, or a lot of things that this kind of orchestration layer can help with. So you can also use directly the APIs of all the models, but we found that it'd be useful if you want to swap in things and out that you actually start using the framework. A lot of these frameworks are Python centric, so you might have to revise a little bit of your company standards. Um, and the other thing to consider is they move so fast and they break often. So you need a good testing for this. Um, even you know, if you're using this abstraction layer, be aware that things can break uh, quite easily in there. Instead of just making your own code using that middleware, there's another approach that is emerging is people using declarative coding. So declarative is like we would know um, in kind of our infrastructure as code, but it's kind of defining a prompt um, and the question and the model, uh, all these things together, but you kind of make a definition file out of this. In this case, it's just, you know, takes that code and writes this as a JSON which has all the information to run that chain. But uh, there's another uh, example of Olama, which is almost looking like a Docker file, 
they call it a model file where you say this is the model llama 2 these are the temperature this is the context window this is the system prompt so you can kind of see how this is more declarative than encoding and then if you want to do the same thing uh, for kind of fine-tuning your model or kind of quantizing your model uh, you know there's a, another framework called ludwig uh, where you can kind of define how you want to have that transformation done. So interesting to see that it's just not going to be code, but we can also start defining things again uh, in a declarative way. It's, again, YAML. So I put all the pieces together on the board, and now we want to have this to production. One of the questions I often get, like, how do you build, how do you deliver this? What, what pieces do we need to put in our pipeline? And I would say there's three pieces that probably go to your traditional coding pipeline, which is the prompt, the orchestration framework, and the API. It is kind of text with code, and you bundle them up together, and they're very similar. It could be a serverless, it could be container, and you version them very similar to all the rest. Data follows probably its own kind of move, uh, sorry, pipeline for promoting data from one environment to the other. Uh, it has its own pipeline. And then the model is something separate again, where you update uh, the model that has been working um, you know, on your SageMaker or other kind of model running tools, maybe using some um, kind of infrastructure as code tool to define that, what that is. So you will see three pipelines, much like you know, microservices you know, being deployed separately, uh, but they kind of have to work together. And that's why integration testing is key, because if you change something on the prompt, it will have an influence. If you change something on the orchestration framework, it has an influence. Change your data, your model, they're all for influence. So integration testing is key there. So this impact is small changes, big impact. And one of the strange things in this field is that testing is not that defined as it used to be. So Imagine you want to have our text summary of content. How do you test that? One of the simple tests would be, well, the summary needs to be 200 words. That is an exact thing that I can measure. But how do I measure that this text is relevant to the question I asked? That's already a, a little bit different. It's not something I can and express in an exact test. So how do we do this? Well, we actually use other models, smaller models, which have been trained on things like toxicity, relevance, and other characteristics of text, you know, think about NLP, that validate these infra kind of outputs uh, through the whole kind of chain that we built. And that really helps us because we cannot keep doing this from by a human, a manual testing. So either we use a model, that a smaller model, or of course, we use more AI and we use an LLM to ask the question. We ask, hey, this information was the input, this information was the output. What do you think about this quality? What do you think there? So this, these are the two approaches, like exact testing, use a smaller model or use an LLM to kind of automate that testing. And all of this is about creating the test set together that you know that can have, instead of you manually clicking and putting in who's the king of France or other kind of questions to verify this, this test set is key to have more confidence, much like your TDD is about having contact, uh, confidence about deployment. And like I mentioned, could be text quality, text relevance, but it could also be security and privacy testing or uh, sentiment and toxicity. So these are a few of the features you can use uh, models for. You can use the LLMs to scale, like I mentioned before, input, output, and evaluation for by humans, and then use this to compare also with an LLM. So delivery is the same, actually. Um, you can use versioning, A-B testing, it's all the same. One of the things you might struggle with is getting GPU access either on your laptops or in your CI CD. So you might want to see if that is available for you. Model pipeline goes a bit slower. And I can't stress this enough. If you want to have confidence to deliver Gen AI apps, 
start building a test data set, start building that list of tests that you want to use, get your models into place, get your LLMs to valid file, uh, automate that part uh, together with the people. So we got this delivered. We have our test pipeline. Uh, imagine all succeeds. Now we're over to the next part, operating it. And you see a lot of new pieces in the board. Yes, infrastructure is the one we probably know best, but the embeddings and kind of the, uh, the vector databases are a new one. And then the model serving point is something that was typically maybe more in the data lake or kind of in, the, in that part, but now it is part of the application. Now we're also having to monitor the models themselves and the framework. So a lot of ground to color. What you will see is that the observability tools, the existing ones, they will focus on things like, oh, what is the API response time? What is the token? What is the cost? Yes, that's interesting, but it's only one part of the things that you need to watch. There's other things now, like the time to first token, time per output token, the latency of that response time, like I mentioned. So it's not just about the first kind of API response, it is about the token things as well. So th this is also an interesting metric. And then you want to, like we tested things in our test pipeline, you want to continuously monitor the quality of those things. So what are um, the, because the one thing you cannot test is all the inputs people are typing in the question or the data they are bringing in. So you want to have this test set being almost like a health check, a health check that goes continually and also checks all input output responses for certain kind of qualities. An interesting extension is to also send this by uh, open LLMetry, like it's a pun on open telemetry to kind of bring this in. Um, there'll probably be some convergence there happening as well. And the PII and the security metrics for kind of jailbreaks or other PII uh, data leakage is also something you could start monitoring because it's input, output, and whatever goes out there. You want to monitor what is actually going out. Uh, to give you an example of, you know, an LLM uh, way of testing a quality metric like prompt injection is uh, like a, a simple example. Imagine you're a very good uh, security researchers. Here's a bunch of prompts. What do you think about the prompt? Is this a good prompt? Is this a, a prompt injection? Yes, no. So this would be an example to use an LLM. And some of them are building even products around that to have a specific large language model that has been trained on these prompts or security things and have you uh, give information back uh, while it's going. So there's a whole new industry kind of spinning up around this. What about masking your PII, right? You put the prompt in, there's a middle layer that kind of removes the personal thing, asks the question, and then gives a response back. So another kind of security asset in there. And what about not doing this in all applications, but actually doing this in the network? Uh, you know, think about this as a WAF for input, output, what goes over the wire, and kind of start filtering these as well. And we got security, we got the whole monitoring, but maybe you also want to have some caching. And how do we do question caching? If a question that was asked, we check whether there was already another similar question, and then we return the same result. So that's kind of how the LLM embedding uh, is used to also kind of uh, for caching and performance and cost. And then Another additional value is, you know, that uh, I explained that there's not one prompt, there's usually multiple prompts and there's a call for an API and extension. So you want to have like the, this traces, like one first prompt generates multiple other prompts. So you want to have this traceability and to dig in in what actually went wrong in this one simple kind of question that a user asked uh, and all the things that were used to uh, assemble the answer. And then you can mix those kind of chains with the relevance and the quality metrics in there. This is a tool uh, called Langsmith, uh, you know, built on top of Langchain uh, to kind of make this easier. And so you can kind of tag your use case and kind of do some filtering in there. So these are things that the traditional kind of tr tracing or observability tools don't give you yet. 
And maybe this evolves into a new space, rag ops, where somebody is responsible to deal with the data, the performance, the observability, anything there. So as usual, there is an acronym that has something called ops at the end. You can not look for only system feedback or automated testing. You can obviously ask also the human for kind of testing. We can try different prompts by using A-B a -B testing, like tools called Gantry allow you to do that. So you, you can kind of first control those separately from your code. And you can also capture user end user feedback, whether that's a thumbs up, thumbs down, you kind of know where that was good. When people copy kind of the code or the text, you know that they are willing to use it. So they might be uh, you know, happy enough with the result, or you might want to have a try again button. If they're not happy, then you know it if they hit that button. And to avoid them only editing the text outside, you might want to provide a text editor inside your platform to kind of have people edit the result of the LLM and then kind of know what has been edited. And you capture all that information to kind of build a better data set for your testing and also understand what you need to tune in your prompt. So there's a lot of unknowns in this, uh, things you cannot perfectly test. So this becomes like, you know, we'll fix it. No, we'll test it in prod and we'll just have a better monitoring. So monitoring is key to deal with the uncertainty of production uh, or of all these kind of generative AI uh, kind of uh, things. Last part I wanna mention, we got it up and running, we got it delivered, we got it operating, business as usual. So what do we need to do there? It's an explosion. So you recognize this kind of you know, early stage, one year old kind of world. It's just uh, a lot. So you have to kind of uh, keep tabs on that. But more importantly, on the human side and the organizational side, what we want is, what we saw is that in the beginning, data and engineering, they were kind of a little bit like two silos. Um, and we wanted to bring them closer together. Maybe that's per, per, first by embedding some engineering in data science, and then kind of embedding some data science into engineering. But this might eventually all end up in your platform team or your data platform team as one of the services because all your teams might start using RAG or the firewall or the observability tool. So this is important that you kind of get this into all your engineers and even your product managers, and it doesn't stay a silo on the side because that will not scale your future growth of AI in your company. And it will be important that you will be able to not just CI, CD, but these things require new patterns of thinking uh, to bring that into your product. So keep that in mind. And you would say, in a way, this is shifting raft, right kind of data science towards production. And some call this the rise of the AI engineer as kind of a new profession, uh, the ones who kind of cobble all these things together as an integrator. Eventually, this might end up being all AI native products, uh, kind of like cloud native. It's like infused everywhere. Your product owners have to think about this in their backlog. How does, you know, put more AI in the product? Uh, or what features can we uh, add solving uh, used uh, using AI? And then for a lot of the things, you use data and AI as a dependency, much like your code dependencies. It is something that you have security controls on. You have to have scrutiny, what goes in, what goes out. So that's very similar. It is just expanding the dependency set of that. And that kind of legal and security is also something you want to use to kind of gain trust. You want to uh, radiate your values to kind of your customers, whether that's on a legal thing when they sign the contract, whether that's on the business level that they trust you to uh, to run the platform with AI. But that's also in your technical level is that you understand what your engineers are doing to kind of keep track on what AI is used, how it is used, what data goes in. So you'll kind of have to have some principles there. What I do want to stress is that um, a lot of customers might ask you to have an opt-in, opt-out on AI, but I see this being a costly affair in the end. So imagine you're building this AI-powered search and uh, some of your customers are opting out and others are using it. Eventually, you're creating a fork in your code. 
And it's going to be really hard to, at a certain point, to have maintain those two systems. So try to avoid this opt out for a longer period uh, because that's going to cost you in the end. There's going to be legislation that you have to adhere to. Uh, European Union is kind of trying to do its best to describe, uh, you know, what is limited risk, what is unacceptable risk, what is high risk. And Hello has to do a lot on like what kind of functions do you allow AI to take a decision, yes or no. So that's something for you to look at as well. And I know it is about, you know, having your customers trust AI. But be aware that like the more you train, the more you automate your decisions by AI is do they actually trust your customer? So there's a new kind of idea on humble AI is that, you know, they're not going to deny things uh, that humans or customers want to do on a certain basis. So be aware of that as well. And it is important that you don't hide AI. Um, you can use it to your advantage kind of put some sparkles on your existing icons, show that it's being generated, use the fact that it's slow by indicating that this is AI, use a separate color. So don't try to hide AI um, and make it more visible and clear this is being used. And your customers will also understand that they are, uh, the results is something they need to verify uh, in the end. If you want to look more about this, there's a a great talk about you know light language UI uh, to kind of get people to trust more on the UI level as well. And then you, we've built all that stuff, but we need to sell this. And this is quite costly, especially still now in this emerging phase. So, you know, where do you bring this into your pricing strategy? A flat fee is going to be hard. It depends on your use case, but you have a lot of documents. It makes sense to do this per usage or... Uh, kind of um, have this built to your customers with a, a certain amount uh, of um, tokens and you know whatever your company calls tokens, it's not the, the technical tokens, but there's a metering going on. And this is sometimes hard because there's one thing hard that is changing pricing structure and the controls in a company. So be aware that there's uh, some work for you there potentially. The spend is gonna rise. We're now at a period at the end of the year, typically to get your budgets. So make sure that there's some budget for AI and this 10 AI tooling uh, and in, in a way that you can actually um, get um, that into the budget without having to discuss this over and over again. What I would say in the moment right now, also multiply this by a factor because what you're going to do in the beginning of the year, you might is already legacy. You might have to redo this again. So we're still at a high pricing cost uh, and make sure um, yeah, you calculate that into your kind of budgets for next year. And it will get uh, kind of cheaper. It will move into the fabric, but I want to urge you to start building your Gen AI muscle right now. Um, because we already thinking about the differentiator. So if you miss this step, you might not be as fast to kind of move to the next step. And if you don't move to the next step, your competitor will likely do already do this. So keep ahead of that strategic advantage uh, by building that muscle right now. And a lot of people told me, you know, in the end, we were late to this DevOps things, but we don't want to be late for this AI party. And that's kind of, I hear a lot from people on this journey. So uh, I encourage you to be on that journey. And yes, we'll kind of go in over engineering for a while, you know, kind of like, you know, prompt engineering, we'll have prompt engineers with prompt flow pipelines, and we're going to make a mess of this, but, you know, that that is what we do. Uh, but think about this, like, English is the new programming language, and it is an amazing time to be alive. Uh, and to kind of start working on this is uh, extremely gratifying. Um, this is be my talk. I hope you learn a lot of this. Um, I'm happy to talk about your journey. If you're just beginning on the journey, or if you're already further on the journey, right? Let me know. Happy to help. Help. Happy to kind of and make your uh, own team enthusiastic about this and see how we can go from there. If you want to have this video or other videos of other talks that I gave, and please also subscribe to the YouTube channel below. And thank you very much. And over to you, Steve. Well, 
thank you, Patrick. That, as always, such a such a great talk. Um, thank you very much for doing the keynote with us. Um, folks, if you want to talk to Patrick, hopefully you're going to be around the Slack channel for a little while. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, and we saw the, the contact details there. Um, well, we have a little bit left, um, time left, uh, Patrick. Any last thoughts you want to leave people? Um, I would say if you're um, people from the DevOps space, they feel that it is not their world uh, because they always thought about they're not data scientists. They don't know the math. Well, you know what? This is not about the math. This is all about integration. And if there's one thing that DevOps people are good at, it is integration. So this is your moment to kind of get in that field. And if the second thing that we're pretty good at is dealing with uncertainty with an operational background, we're used to this. We got observability, right? So that's why maybe the message that I want to give people is like why they think that this is not kind of their field. It is definitely their field uh, to be in. Yeah. I mean, you you raised a fabulous subject. There's lots of people interested. And as you said, lots of people are asking how to do this. So if you were going to, is there I don't know, one new skill or something that you'd say that the audience, because obviously most of our audience are in the DevOps space, but we obviously have developers as well. But if there's, if you said there's one thing you should put, plan to put in your resume, you know, what would you think that would be? Hmm. Um, I think that would be actually experience with one of the frameworks. So that's, if you put in, I have experience in, with a model, that's only one part. If I experience with a prompt, it's only one piece. But if you got like the, that fifth piece, that orchestration framework, that shows that you kind of are able to put them all together. So that, that, that's kind of what I would be looking at. So take take a look at Langchain, Llama, Index, some of those frameworks uh, um, and kind of start building some demos out of there. Uh, look at some open source code, uh, where that's like managing your Kubernetes, you know, using that. There's plenty of examples there that you can tap into. Uh, and that's probably the the most useful for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's like so. Don't be frightened of this stuff. It's it's new tech. It's amazing, but you can you have to start somewhere. So the best thing to do is just start. So yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes left before we start the next session, so we're going to have to have a little gap here. Um, just to remind everybody, it's All Day DevOps, October 26th. We are still going. We have a lot more sessions. We have a lot, we have six tracks, loads of sessions for you to go, loads of great speakers. Go take the time to go visit the Slack channel. Go have a look. Look for um, people you've um, uh, – look for new friends. There's always somebody on there. Go look at the speakers that you've seen so far. Go – uh, go talk to them on Slack, ask them questions. They're everybody, you know, we're all here to help each other. So please make use of this opportunity. Uh, and obviously all these talks will be available later. If you see something that you're interested in or you, you know, just turn up on Slack and ask or reach out to the speakers and let them know what a good job they did and what, what else you want to do. Just please help us make this, you know, the great day that all day DevOps is. And with that, I think we'll stop there. I said we're going to take a, a tiny break uh, and 10 minutes until the hour, and then all the sessions will remain. So thank you very much and see you later. <laughs>